Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait for one minute before we kick off this event. Thank you for waiting. All right, um, I think we can start now, we can begin. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is David Leal Ayala. I'm the deputy head of the Policy Links Unit here in Cambridge. And today we will be doing two things. First, I will be presenting some of our recent work uh, looking at how innovation policy programs might help to diversification, recovery and growth after the COVID-19 pandemic in small island states followed by a discussion on the realities of implementing innovation policy programs in the Caribbean. And for this discussion, we are delighted to be joined today by doc Dr. Kieran Swift. Uh, Kieran is a seasoned development consultant and innovation policy specialist. His experience ranges across the public, private, and academic sectors in the domains of science, technology, and innovation policy. Um, he is a graduate of the University of the West Indies with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical and Computer Engineering and the Science Policy Research Unit, SPRU, of the University of Sussex with a specialization, a master's degree in public policies for science, technology, and innovation, and also a PhD in science and technology policy studies. So until very recently, uh, Kieron worked with the Compete Caribbean Partnership Facility, which is a private sector development program focused on stimulating economic growth productivity, innovation, and competitiveness, operating in around 13 Caribbean countries, if I'm right. And Compete Caribbean is a partnership among the IDV, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, the Caribbean Development Bank, and the governments of the UK and Canada. So here in Compete, Kieran led the identification, design, project preparation, and management of a portfolio of technical assistance projects in the region. Um, so later today, we will be talking to Kieran about the key messages emerging from, from my initial presentation. And as I said before, in particular, we will ask him to reflect and discuss with us about some of the realities of implementing innovation policy programs in the Caribbean. So if I may use this, before I get into the topic, let me tell you a little bit about who we are. Uh, so Policy Links is a not-for-profit consultancy unit that works with governments to develop effective industrial innovation policies. We are based at IFM Engage, the knowledge transfer arm of the Institute for Manufacturing in Cambridge University, which is where I'm located at the moment. And we are really a, a team of engineers, economists, and political scientists with a shared passion for big policy problems and solutions, of course. And our work combines both the study of academic insights and the analysis of policy implementation in countries around the world. Um, we are part of what is known as Cambridge Industrial Innovation Policies. It's a community that includes the Center for Science, Technology and Innovation Policy and the Babash Policy Forum. And really what brings us together, the three entities, is a focus on the interplay between the first eye of industry and industrial competitiveness and the second eye of innovation and technology. Also, we're brought together by an interest in understanding the role of government policies in fostering knowledge flows between innovation and industrial competitiveness. And of course, in the integration of engineering and economic perspectives to further this understanding. So for today's session, uh, we have divided this session into two parts. As I said before, I will start by setting the scene, talking about um, three projects that we have done in collaboration with the Inter-American Development Bank and Compete Caribbean. 
And after this, we will have a discussion with Kieran on the realities of implementing innovation policy programs in the Caribbean and potential strategies to overcome common challenges. So during the discussion, we will be answering some of your pre-submitted questions, but also feel free to use the, the Q&A menu here in, in Zoom to ask new questions, and we will try to incorporate them into the discussion. So now, if I may start with the, with the first part of this session, the, my presentation before we get into the discussion. So to kick off today, I will now talk a little bit, as I said, about three recent projects we have done with the Inter-American Development Bank and Compete Caribbean, which were aimed at designing a specific innovation policy programs for three countries in particular, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, and St. Lucia and the common challenges that we have observed when moving from design to the implementation of these programs. Um, as you can see from this slide, the titles of these three projects are Centers of Excellence for Trinidad and Tobago, Support to Jamaica's Innovation System for Promoting Innovative Firms, and Technical Assistance to Implement the National Competitiveness Agenda for, of St. Lucia. So, after working on all three projects, we have identified some common drivers for action among these countries, and in particular, some, some common features in these countries. Um, in particular, they usually have a narrow production base, uh, which leads also to an undiversified economy. They, have, they tend to have concentrated export and import markets, also a relatively higher vulnerability to natural disasters and the impact of climate change, because obviously, these are islands in the Caribbean. And um, they, they tend to have a reduced R&D activity in the private sector. Also, you can say that their national innovation systems are at an early stage of development. And in particular, this is evidenced by having a slightly more fragmented governance in these national innovation systems when compared to other countries. And also something that, that we observe in common is perhaps that the tertiary, tertiary education attainment tends to be below the OECD average. So a key feature that these have in common as well is really that there is, beyond these common drivers of action, there is a recognition that, or at least some stakeholders within the government recognize innovation as a potential strategy to address some of those contextual challenges, and in particular, as a pathway to productivity, competitiveness, and economic diversification. So. Borrowing this framework from the World Bank, there's a recognition in, in, in parts of these countries that investing in innovation inputs and knowledge activities, such as technology development and adoption, R&D, human capital, adoption of best practices, and so on. So on. Firms within, doing, by doing this, firms within these countries can achieve innovation outputs and outcomes, such as new products and services, improve business processes and business models, et cetera, which will in turn allow firms to grow, achieve productivity growth and also economic diversification of the country in general. So this is in general the purpose of, innovations, of innovation policies as we will see in the next slides. Now, when working on these, um, on these countries or when supporting these countries in the design of detailed innovation policy programs, we have really made an effort to adapt this to the local context and to do that we have followed the approach outlined here. First of all, we strongly believe that nobody knows more about the local context uh, or the local context needs that, than local stakeholders. And therefore, all of our work here in the Caribbean has been underpinned by very broad consultation exercises, uh, either through interviews, roundtable discussions, role mapping workshops or service, and so on. We really believe that it is difficult for an external consultant to understand the local context without this element. Having said all this, we also believe that there are very useful lessons that can be acquired from international experience when designing new programs for specific countries. And therefore, we often conduct very comprehensive reviews of best practices around the world, and we aim to adapt these lessons learned to the local context. And thirdly, obviously being part of, of Cambridge Industrial Innovation Policy Community and, and being at the University of Cambridge, we base all our recommendations and work on the latest academic theory and frameworks, including, for example, national innovation systems theory, development economics, and general innovation policy theory. So 
taking all this into consideration, uh, let me briefly explain the key initiatives that we proposed and designed together with the Inter-American Development Bank and Compete Caribbean for each specific country. So the first country I want to talk to you about is Jamaica. So of the three countries that, are, that I've been uh, mentioning, Jamaica is probably the one with the most mature national innovation system, which is helped by the fact that they have implemented several initiatives in recent years to improve their national innovation system. However, uh, if there's a belief or there's evidence to suggest that Jamaica's national innovation system is still underperforming in specific areas. For example, in particular, uh, with regards to firm level innovation activity, there was a, a recent survey of more than 240 firms in the country that found out that roughly 12% of Jamaican firms were innovating at the time, compared to, for example, 46% in Suriname or 24% in Trinidad and Tobago. So it is really in this context that the project here that I'm showing you here was designed in collaboration with the Inter-American Development Bank to identify suitable innovation policy mechanisms that could help to foster firm level innovation, uh, focus or starting with three specific sectors or areas that could be uh, implemented in the short term. Um, as you can see in the slide, the three areas of intervention were support for the digital transformation of existing sectors through a digital technology advisory service and innovation voucher, and support to the development of a fintech ecosystem by establishing an incubator accelerator program for fintech solutions and support to develop high value agricultural products through the creation of uh, what we call a food cosmetics innovation center that could complement existing initiatives in the country. So this project is still ongoing and currently IDB is exploring the opportunities to move from the design to the implementation stage in collaboration with the Development Bank of Jamaica. And we can talk a little bit more about this during the discussion with Kieran. So secondly, um, the second project I want to show you has to do with the development of five centers of excellence, also known as research and technology organizations in Trinidad and Tobago. So the context here is that, as you may know, Trinidad and Tobago's economy is strongly dependent on the income from its oil and petrochemical sector. So therefore, in recent times, there have been efforts to promote the diversification of the economy into other high value added sectors. So in this project, we work together with uh, local stakeholders within the government and also with the Inter-American Development Bank to first identify five economic areas where the country could develop high value activities through innovation while building on existing local capabilities. So in collaboration with local stakeholders, uh, the five areas that were selected for these were ICT products and services, high value agricultural based products, energy engineering services, maritime services and aviation services. So really the purpose of the project was to create the detailed design operational specifications and implementation roadmaps for these centers of excellence working on these areas. And the idea was or is that these centers could work directly with companies, with firms in the country, providing key innovation services such as applied R&D, advisory and infrastructure, um, and all things around access to equipment and laboratories and support with new product and service development. So the design stage of the project was completed around 2019, and it has now moved into the less straightforward implementation phase, let's say, which is something we will discuss in a minute. And let me show you the next slide. So lastly, the final project I want to show you is what we call uh, technical assistance to implement the national competitiveness agenda of St. Lucia. So St. Lucia is perhaps different than Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago in the sense that its national innovation system is less mature or less, less developed. In other words, some of the key national strategies and institutions that, are, that already exist in Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago are not yet present in St. Lucia. It is also a smaller country, which has implications for what can be done in terms of the level of investment in innovation and the availability of local skills. But regardless of this, some of the key development challenges faced by St. Lucia are very similar to other nations in the Caribbean. And in this context, 
the purpose of this project was to create a comprehensive agenda of activities that could support the competitiveness, productivity, and innovation at the firm level to help develop economic sectors beyond the tourism sector, which is the main activity in Seleucia at the moment. And similarly to the previous projects, we carried out an extensive stakeholder consultation to narrow down the sectors and types of innovation activities needed. And after selecting a few of them for implementation in the short term, we created detailed specifications and implementation roadmaps that could be followed by local stakeholders in charge of future implementation. Um, something or one of the things that we did differently in this project in St. Lucia is that because of its size and the level of maturity of its national innovation system, we carried out an online capacity building program for all or, or many of the local stakeholders, stakeholders sorry, who will be involved in the implementation of the national competitiveness agenda. So this was actually a very success, successful program with a high participation and being online, it allowed us to reach a large number of stakeholders through a combination of live and pre-recorded sessions and presentations, readings and other activities and exercises. So we completed this project at the beginning of this year. And again, the project has recently moved into the implementation phase where we have some, some key challenges, which I want to mention in my next slide. Um, so for my final slide, uh, which I want to use to structure the discussion that we are having with Kieran today, is about, as I mentioned, some selected challenges we have observed when projects move from the design stage to the actual implementation of innovation policy programs. So Kieran has kindly suggested uh, these three main categories to structure the discussion today, uh, which are imagination, coordination, and implementation. So some common challenges that I can organize in, in this framework, uh, classified on this framework, include, for example, political support. So something that we have observed in all three projects mentioned before is that moving to the implementation phase often requires a big convincing effort by the champions of the project towards other stakeholders within government and the broader innovation system. So this is what we have seen is that this is often related to three main elements. One is the level of awareness and understanding of the value of innovation within government and also within firms. It is also related to the resistance stemming from misconceptions perhaps about the scale of the cost involved in implementing innovation policy programs or carrying out, out actual innovation in companies. And we have also encountered stakeholders with a mindset or a belief that it is not possible to compete with leading industrialized nations and learn from them. And therefore innovation policy programs are slightly risky to their eyes. Um, another challenge uh, more related to the coordination bit is the fragmented nature of the national innovation systems in these countries. And, uh, and particularly there might be different uh, initiatives already in place, but they are uh, not coordinated or they are very isolated from each other. And third, something that, that again we can discuss with Kieran is the availability of skills and expertise both to conduct innovation at the firm level but also to implement policy programs in the government which also represents a challenge. We have actually discussed some of these points in a, in a blog that is in our website so that you can go and read if you're interested. Um, but now on this note really um, I would like to ask Kieran to join me as we discuss some of these findings. So Kieran, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and, and to the audience, I want to say again, if you have any questions, please note them down in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will address them during the discussion session. So hi, Kieran. Kieran, hi. Uh, thank you hi, for David. joining. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Good morning to everyone. Or good afternoon, depending on what part of the world you're sending in. Yes. So, Kieran, I mean, I guess to kick off the discussion, um, just to say we have looked or I have already looked at, at some of the common contextual features that potentially justify the use of innovation policy in the Caribbean. Now we're going through a, a big pandemic in the COVID-19 crisis. So in the context of this COVID-19 crisis and the impact uh, that it may have had on these countries, um, I wanted to ask you, what is 
your perspective on the main challenges ahead? Obviously, we know that there were challenges before COVID, but what are the, the main challenges ahead considering this crisis? And how can innovation policy really help to address these new challenges, this new context? So just sure. to kick, kick off the conversation there. Sure. Thanks, David. So, I mean, yeah, as you're saying, it's, it's, it's fairly obvious that the entire globe has continues to be impacted by the current pandemic. But I think if, let's put the, the Caribbean in uh, Caribbean's COVID-19 impact in, in some context. So the IDB recently issued its uh, regular quarterly Caribbean uh, economic bulletin. And, and that has sort of emphasized the point that the, these unprecedented shocks to some of the key sectors in this region, particularly around tourism and resource exports, have led to some of the largest year-on-year -year or single-year declines in growth ever recorded for the region, ever, since you know, data on this has been consistently captured. And when you, you map that to the, the significance of some of those key exports, um, obviously the, the countries that have been most dependent on tourism have been the ones hardest hit. Um, uh, again, to put that in context, the, the Tourism Dependency Index which measures the, the role of tourism in, in overall earnings for countries. And not, not surprisingly, nine of the countries you know, within the Caribbean fall within the top 20 of that, of that index globally. So, so you have that aspect of it. You have also the fact that you know, throughout 2020, there's been a double digit shock to, to real GDP um, in these countries. Uh, and again, this is, is again, some of the largest declines, largest drops ever on record. So what, what then does that leave for, for us? Well, one, obviously we're currently in a significant hole and getting out of that hole and getting back to pre-pandemic levels of, of per capita income in the best cases is estimated to take place no earlier than a year or two from now. And in, in some of the worst cases, it may take up to a decade to get back to where they will in 2019. So on paper, what this then points to is, is governments within the region seriously thinking more about the, their economic structures, about diversification, about vulnerabilities. I emphasize on paper because um, a lot of the recovery <laughs> plans and so on that, that, that have been published, on one hand, understandably, have been focused in on, on you know, the current emergency. I think Absolutely. to my mind, there's a lot more that needs to be said about beyond uh, COVID and what, it, what is going to be put in place now to, to take us beyond COVID. Um, some of the immediate challenges obviously relate to increasing the resilience of firms, um, accelerating digitalization, which is a you know, drum we've been beaten for the past decade at least, uh, helping SMEs access finance to mitigate some of their current supply chain and trade issues. Um, continuing to provide emergency financial support for firms to help them, you know, compensate workers and, and defer obligations and so on. But the, 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 the real meat of it, the more medium term to, to longer term challenges that are, are presented by COVID really haven't changed, if you will. Um, so it goes back to things like improving the business environment. It goes yeah. back to in, in increasing and inviting more sustainable FDI. It goes back to improving the quality of the workforce through not just qualifications on people, but through training, through mentorship, um, long-term fi long financing rather for, for capital expenditures tied to innovation. But critically, as you, as, we, as you mentioned, as we know, innovation happens at the firm level. So bringing it right back down to the firm and helping firms develop really effective competitive strategies that, that are premised on innovation as the, the difference maker for them differentiating the niche that can help them compete. Brilliant. No, that, I, I fully agree. I, I think it's very interesting that uh, you make that point that on paper, uh, they're paying, perhaps paying more attention to this. And I think that takes us nicely to, to your point on the framework on imagination and what I was talking about, the support or political support, let's say. Yeah. So I can imagine that also in your previous work and your experience in Compete Caribbean, you have had to, to deal with this situation where you have to actually build the business case to convince different stakeholders that innovation policy is worth it, that they should be pursued, that the, they should invest in it. So I was wondering for, for maybe for practitioners out there that, that could be uh, listening to us here, do you have any practical advice on how or strategies on how to achieve this? How do you sell it to, let's say, high-level uh, 
polit polit politicians yeah. or people in the, the political system that this matters and this this is important. So David, if I were a pessimistic man, I'd tell you I don't have any strategy that's just throwing my hands up <laughs> and I give up. Because uh, Compete for Caribbean, for example, even prior to my being a part of that team, has been banging this particular drum for at least the past 10 years. Uh, at, at the root, I would say, before we get to the challenge, the, the strategy, one of the key challenges has been relatability, relatability of science, technology, and innovation to what, what is perceived, uh, or both perceived and reality, actuality of the pressing social, economic, and environmental uh, challenges of the day. So innovation as a concept is only partially understood by, by most. And even then, only some yeah. aspects of it are really grasped by, by most. So collectively, there tends to be a mismatch between the, the idea and the conceptions people have around innovation and what is what continues to emerge as the, the, the real demand for solutions on the ground. So just to drill a little bit further into that, I mean, you know, you, you there are in different quarters, innovation is sort of was more about uh, invention, you know, so then you end up getting a, a focus on, on research primarily. Or, more about creating new firms, right? Or, or more about culture change. You get a lot of focus on, on educational type efforts and, and promotional type efforts and so on. Or even more about IP. It's all about IP, intellectual property and so on. Um, but the absence of real business strategy to, to capitalize on that IP. So none of these approaches by themselves, as you could imagine, really uh, knit together, none of them are comprehensive enough. Um, to, to achieve the sort of ecosystem perspective that is required. Um, another aspect I think that we don't often talk enough about is really neglecting the importance uh, uh, and the existence even of indigenous or grassroots innovation. Yep. So these are things that are largely informal. They don't rank on the, the standard matrix, matrices and so on and metrics, um, but they feel authentic. We, we, you know, living in this region, you can encounter on a day-to-day -day basis ways in which people are not just creating new things, but delivering value uh, by doing something that hasn't been done before. And these small scale pockets of activity and, and firms and, and makers and so on, they tend to be overlooked by these innovation um, support programs. Um, but they're important because they, they, they provide representation. People can see themselves in them, yep. so they feel authentic. Um, and then the third part I would say, before we start to talk about probably some strategies would be lack of trust. Um, lack of trust premised on information asymmetries, lack of trust premised on corruption. Um, so, the, you know, if, if you have masses, you know, who expect that the systems you have on paper aren't going to work, then by default, they, they look for ways uh, around them. And, you know, personal networks then become much more important. So, yeah, everywhere in the world, who you know and who knows you is important. But in these smaller societies, those personal networks gain uh, increase primacy. So with these, some of these factors really then on the cutting, if you will, um, that, that, that presented, presentation of those business cases, the, you know, really emphasizing the value of innovation. I would say that the strategies that, that, that and I would say this is really still a work in progress for me because I, I'm still, <laughs> you know, the stage of my career yeah. was to try to get this to, to land and to, to, to last long term. But I would say the strategies have to be premised on um, presenting innovation in authentic and localized context, presenting right. it in ways that build upon um, existing competencies uh, of existing firms um, and organizations within the country, uh, and, and really emphasizing and underlining how innovation presents solutions to local problems, be they environmental, be they economic, social, and obviously the integration of, of, the, of the three. And then also practically how they generate employment, how they generate exports. Thank you. Now I, I fully agree. That's very interesting. I, it's almost um, on that note of the grassroots innovation. I was wondering if there are any particular examples of, let's say, bottom-up approach or, or innovation policy, kind of uh, perhaps in Trinidad. Where, have you seen any examples of? grassroots innovation becoming so prominent or so important that it has to be supported, that it gets a particular attracts attention enough or develops enough critical mass that it has to become uh, or 
it has to be supported by government or perhaps uh, you know strategies need to be developed around it is that something that happened i would actually redirect that because the example that comes to mind isn't something that that was able to grow based on support from government just the, the, the nature of it so there's a, a, a i was about to say local now a regional mm. uh, fintech firm we pay right it originated out of trinidad but now headquartered in jamaica the reason why they moved is a story for a different day but <laughs> You know, when we pay started offering its services initially, they, they 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 premised it on not you know we have the best technology. The premise is on something people are comfortable with. People are comfortable going to the lotto booth and purchasing you know a ticket and so on. So that modality was what we pay first started with, and people are you know a lot of people to, to purchase a, a top up um, that they could then use online. So we get a slip of paper that they could then use online to make online purchases. So recognizing you had a significant un, unbanked and underbanked um, proportion of society, less than 20% or so having credit cards. That was something that in trying to connect people to online payment mechanisms and to being able to engage in e-commerce, connected with them via a mechanism that they understand that they were already comfortable with. Now, obviously, WP has gone on to many other, you know, a much more diverse portfolio now, but that is the example that, stands, that comes out. And, that has nothing to do with government support. Right. To my understanding. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So I guess going back to, to the initial point that I put there uh, in my final slide, uh, I was talking also about the misconceptions. Uh, and you, I think you already touched a little bit on this, on, on you know how innovation has different meanings and it's difficult to define sometimes yeah. uh, and grasp. Um, but what we have, face in our experience is also there are very concrete and specific misconceptions for example about financial costs no there, there's a belief that you have to be a rich country to invest in innovation and my answer has always been that that's not necessarily the case that there are uh, let's say low financial or interventions that require only low financial cost that can actually make a huge difference for example if you're targeting the governance of the innovation system and so on so i wanted to, to also kind of uh, get your perspectives on that on, on the you know what do you think could be the biggest obstacles towards the development of better governance structures which doesn't really take a lot of money yeah uh, but could make a huge difference in terms of how existing investments are are, are used and how more whether they can become more effective you know yeah so i think i think when, when you look at that point uh there's clearly a case where how one imagines how one envisions uh innovation and, and coordination of innovation um would directly impact how you go about setting it up and as you said one of the best ways to sell these type of things is to not promote them as being very very costly to even get going right so if you think about governance Obviously, we want to, to learn from countries that are, are more successful in terms of innovation outputs. And we look at those frameworks, uh, those you know, successful innovation uh, uh, country contexts. But we need to recognize that those are, when we look at those frameworks, they are snapshots. They are, they are a representation in time of what has evolved in their context um, based on, on you know, just how uh, how industry, how the, the economic environment and so on evolved. Um, but it's just that it, it, it was the result of a journey, it was the result of, of an evolution. So their current best practice, if you will, varies significantly from their own initial starting conditions and also very significantly from our starting conditions, governance and institution wise in the Caribbean. So, you know, I know there's very often a tension to try to, to, to match and to allocate and say, okay, you need a research council. So let's create a research council. You need a policy council. Let's create one or let's, let's allocate this, this entity yeah. here. Um, but both of those types of activities, either creating new entities or reallocating them when they've been sort of firmly established in one mode, you need to overcome a significant amount of inertia to get either one of those or both of those types of activities done. Inertia in terms of understanding, so cognitive inertia, inertia in terms of cost, right, as we just started out talking about, inertia in terms of institutional knowledge. So a different approach might be to try to optimize the operation of the existing structures 
but to overlay sort of you know matrix arrangement projects and so on um, that are tied to lines of activity that are generally headed in the right direction and that you know with the, the, the relevant amount of support could get you where you need to be so a, a clear case i mean right now um kicking off today the, the oecs is undertaking a significant online um, sustainable development movement forum but focus on the blue economy the blue economy is yeah. a terminology that you know is gaining increasing prominence uh in the caribbean um and to, to really zero in and to focus on the blue economy you need to tackle a few different things fisheries marine spatial planning um ports uh, and, and and infrastructure yeah. construction marine biology tourism all right so Organi organizing an innovation structure, innovation governance structure to tackle an issue of importance and significant importance to a Caribbean country. One of the ways I would suggest going about it would be to organize it around these themes, around these you know important themes that are cross country. Yeah. Yes, you may have a, a lead agency or something like that, but you you by definition have to involve multiple different agencies, and then you arrange them around particular key projects. Um, in the in the short term where they okay. end up and where, where they mature to in the long term is a different matter but we, we often try to jump steps and, and try to put it in the final, yeah. final stage yeah final that's, stage. that's true that i think that those are very good points um so go, going back to the misconceptions like it's the other one that i was uh really curious about asking you is we have also faced this um, belief, let's say, or mindset sometimes uh, that local stakeholders believe also not only that innovation policy is expensive, or do you have to be a rich country to, to implement programs like those, but also that what is the point of it? There's no point in competing with uh, more industrialized nations that perhaps have a longer tradition of uh, science and technology development, of research and development. Uh, or just a scientific tradition, no? So are there any particular examples of, you know, knowledge diffusion adoption initiatives uh, that you can share with us to prove that it is possible to compete? You, well, you don't necessarily have to compete, first of all, with, with richer countries, but it is possible to have innovation in the Caribbean. Do you have any, any, any examples in mind? Uh, a, a couple uh, in varying stages of maturity, um, and you know, as you as you rightly say, it isn't about small countries competing because you know, research you 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 respond to the question that you ask. So countries with, with a longer history of, of research will be posing different questions and responding to, to different questions than those that are uh, of greatest importance and most pressing to the to the Caribbean, so or to small island developing states. Um, I would say for countries in the Caribbean, for small island developing states, science and technology have to be put in the context of its application. So not the generation of science and technology for their own sake, but how they are applied. And from that standpoint, you know, the research and technological organizations and tech transfer offices um, play a significant role in knowledge diffusion and, and knowledge adoption. So I'm um, drawing some examples here, some specific examples from Trinidad and Tobago, just because those are the ones that come yeah. first, uh, top to mind. Kariri, yeah. the Caribbean Industrial Research Institute, has been long been an important fixture um, in the industrial space, starting, you know, and based in offering testing and analytical services. But in the past, you know, within the past decade, building out a whole center for enterprise development, we're focusing more on incubation and partnership with an ICT center at Microsoft and offering innovation advisory services. Um, UE's Tech Trans office recently reconfigured itself from an office of research, knowledge and uh, research development and knowledge transfer to now a center for innovation and entrepreneurship. So it now really doubles down and emphasizes its role in helping researchers commercialize their research, fund it, and protect it. And while at the same time it presents itself as a focal point for industry to access the technology and expertise that exists within the university. Um, UTT, the University of Trinidad and Tobago, has its own nascent effort, uh, something called the Mechanical Engineering, Manufacturing, and Entrepreneurship uh, Unit. Uh, and they have an advisory committee that is going to look at that unit's programs and research and try to guide them to align it to the needs of, of industry. Um, so I think those are. Uh, 
you know, again, in various stages of maturity. Those are some of the important steps that are needed to ensure that knowledge is diffused and adopted into industry practically. Then you have, you know, at least one other example that comes to mind that doesn't, you know, fit the form of any of the others. Uh, entities like Tech Beach Retreat, mm. um, which takes place, uh, not sure what, what frequency, but often tends to be based in, in Jamaica. And how they build themselves is that they aim to connect the Caribbean's tech or digital ecosystem. So they, they very often attract some, some of the largest players in tech world. So your Googles, your Facebooks, yeah. you know, your Twitters and so on, and allow firms in that space in this region to, to interact with senior executives on those firms. So those are a, a different mechanism that are in play right now within the region to facilitate knowledge diffusion. No, thank you. That that's great, and particularly, uh, I had the experience of visiting Kariri, and I completely agree. I mean, I think it's a fantastic organization, a great example of uh, innovation in Trinidad. So, just to finish on that point of misconceptions, the last one that that I remember also from our experience has to do with there's sometimes this belief that you cannot really learn or take lessons from more industrialized countries because the uh, the context of a small island states in the Caribbean is very different, or at, or at least some people, that's what they often tell us now. Uh, and as I said, for us, in our perspective, international experience lessons from that is very important, actually, even if it's to tailor and to adapt some of those lessons to, to the particular context of each country. So I was wondering, in your experience working with practitioners across different countries, I mean, how can practitioners from development organizations in particular work with local stakeholders to adapt international lessons no? because people from for example the idv etc they work across many countries so is are there is there any particular approach in your experience that works on that yeah so i think it the experiences that work are premised on 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 really getting the idea that that adaptation of lessons learned isn't a, a unidirectional process it isn't just you know you download and you get the answer and you go up and implement. Um, as, as you said, context is, is essential and lessons learned anywhere else need to be met with, with knowledge that is local. So let me, let me give a specific example, right? So uh, at, at, at heart, I am a tennessee recovering engineer. So back in my days of hardcore engineering <laughs> yeah. and writing code, uh, you know, anyone who's done any kind of coding, you would be familiar with, with body concept of body website stack overflow. So yep. anytime you run into a problem with coding and so on, you, know, you can go to Stack Overflow and get a response. But the thing is, if you haven't, if you have no sort of foundation, no sort of experience in coding, you can't go to Stack Overflow and say, okay, I'm just going to get all the answers and create, you know, uh, the, the next uh, uh, unicorn application, you know, from scratch. It doesn't work like that. You need to have been putting in work um, on your own to then be able to, to engage with what the material is available on our Stack Overflow and, and, and apply it. So similarly, when we, we are seeking to adapt lessons learned in other contexts, we need to both assess the, the substance of the knowledge, so what are the actual questions we're pursuing, you know, you know, dealing with climate change, things like how do we balance the needs for economic diversification and increasing role of services with a need to still build out a, a niche high value manufacturing base um, and to, to pursue climate resistant agriculture. Um, and how do we do all of those things in, a, in an experimental, both experiments in the lab, experiments uh, in the firm, experiments in terms of policy. Um, the other thing that I would say is knowledge being cumulative, we need to build on, on what we have yeah. and what we have generated in this region. And, and we have had some world-class scholars who have contributed significantly to economic thought about development of this region. People like Sartre Lewis, people like Norman Gerber, Carrie Leavitt, Lloyd Best, and so on. And some way or the other, we, 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 we somehow disconnect that legacy from what we uh, are, are seeking to do now. So I think connecting to, to that existing legacy, um, contextualizing to, to, to questions that, and, and responses that, and technology that are important to us, and then from that standpoint, um, uh, adapting uh, lessons learned from elsewhere. It, it, it requires the work here. You can't. It is no shortcut. It. Yeah, I fully agree. Um, so I guess that takes us nicely to the next topic in in the slide that was coordination. Um, as I mentioned during the presentation, you know, the, 
there tends to be a fragmented nature of the international mm -hmm. innovation systems of countries in the region, particularly in the, in the Caribbean. And this is effectively a, a barrier for coordination of efforts, no? So I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, what are the particular reasons for this, maybe historical reasons for this fragmentation? What, may, what is the inertia that needs to be, uh, you know, counter to be able to, to solve this issue? And I want to pick on a, on a question from, uh, from the audience as well. Uh, there's a question around this topic. Um, it's to say about, uh, hold on. Will Caribbean countries benefit from attempting to coordinate national innovation policies or taking a pan-Caribbean approach to innovation? So, yeah, just if you have any particular thoughts sure. or reactions to that. I'll, I'll start to that last one. The short answer is yes. The short <laughs> answer is, is, is clearly yes. Um, from a resource standpoint, both intellectual resource, capital, and so on, um, from a, an industrial base standpoint, from a market standpoint, I mean, if you count any individual Caribbean country, not even including the large ones like DR and, and Haiti and so on, which we don't think about in CARICOM terms, um, from any of those standpoints, there is only strength in, in, in adopting a pan Caribbean approach. Um, but to, to the, the question of, of, of fragmentation, um, and perhaps this may add some more meat to that previous part, I'll start with an example. And, and again, you know, apologies. For, uh, colleagues from across the Caribbean, um, the examples that, that come freshest to mind. Do I have been working across the region? The examples yeah. that come freshest to mind, um, perhaps because the pain is deepest, I don't know, um, are, are the ones from Trinidad and Tobago. So in, in, in Trinidad and Tobago, you have three entities that uh, that play, or at least uh, you know, purport to play an important role in the innovation uh, ecosystem. So you have the career that I mentioned earlier, you have UE, University of the West Indies, you have NIGLS, right? National Institute of Higher Education, yeah. Research, Science, and Technology. So two of these three entities share physical location. Yeah. Two others share line ministry. All three of them have specialized skills and specialized expertise that are perceived in many circles as being important to the innovation mission. Yet none of them, at least by my last check, I engage in any sort of cross collaborative programs to directly engage the private sector. Uh, to help stimulate and support firm level innovation. And one of the core problems I've seen, as you're asking, what are some of the reasons for that fragmentation? One of the core problems that I've seen and experienced is a focus more on distinction, focus more on what makes these organizations different, or what makes them stand out, as opposed to the complementarity, the characteristics that they have in common. So even if you have a shared location, you have shared organizational appearance in terms of an ministry, you have common function, you still end up with this fragmentation. I think what can be done to address it is to, in the development of shared visions for innovation, which as I said earlier, has to be grounded in things that are meaningful and meaty for the country, so not airy fairy sort of conceptions about innovation. You then need to, to really play up um, the agencies that you have in that place within, within an ecosystem, play up the interdependencies amongst them, right? They, they play different roles and all the roles are, 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 are relevant. Uh, and those roles are gonna change over time. So if we draw from a history history lesson, if you will, not our own history, but history of Singapore, and you look at their innovation trajectory, we know that at different stages of their industrial evolution, different configurations and institutions play different roles. So at one point, EDB and the JTC where they were on the point, right? When the primary focus was on employment generation and later points in, in their evolution, the Institute of Manufacturing Technology was on point when the focus was on increasing engineering capital intensity. So getting that shared vision for, for what innovation means, whether it's at the, the national level or to the question I was asked at the pan-Caribbean level in very specific terms, doing that inventory of the organization that you have, yes, they are gonna need strengthening, but based on their, their current capacities, what roles can they play? Emphasizing the fact that they need to work together, they are interdependent and, um, uh, and you know, overlaying then specific programs of activity, right? And, and, and I suppose we, we're gonna to get to it really focusing on results and generation of results and measurement yeah. of those results. Yeah, but no, nonetheless, a very big challenge, isn't it? Um, it is. It is. Yeah. It is no, no easy answers. Exactly. Okay. No, I mean, 
thank you very much. And, and just looking at the time, I want to also move to, to the implementation uh, bits of, of, of the slide. I mentioned a little bit about sometimes we found that specific skills and expertise relevant for the implementation of innovation policy programs is sometimes missing or not as, as uh, developed in, in some yeah. of the countries in the region compared to other countries. And that even when there is uh, political support and when there is a will to, to actually do something in terms of creating new programs, this is a potential challenge or a potential barrier. So I, I was wondering if there are any success stories on how to approach capability development for policy implementation in your experience? What are the challenges on this? And also I want to pick again on one, on one question from the audience, which is more targeted uh, to Trinidad and Tobago, but perhaps uh, applies to different countries that it says, um, it seems that the leaders uh, or polit politicians and some leaders in Trinidad per sometimes lack uh, specific knowledge and skills in strategy innovation. Um, and the decisions are made more reactively. What do you mm -hmm. suggest to address this problem? So I think it's related to this topic on skills, no? Well, uh, so yes and, and, and no, because, well, yes it is, but the reason I, I emphasize no there as well, because I think uh, uh, seeing you know the, the question that was posed and emphasis on, on politicians and leaders, that will take us down a, a different road. Not, you know, we don't yeah. need to go down that road, but let me, let me first focus on, on you know, within the public sector itself. Um, so building capacity, and, and as you pointed out, within the region, at least English-speaking region, uh, Jamaica maybe flows ahead in terms of the maturity of its innovation ecosystem, but there are similar tracks and trajectories if you even look at some of the other countries. Um, and, and even some of the programs that, that, that you all at Policy Links have, have done within the region. So there needs to be that capacity building around the right conceptual frameworks. So what are the appropriate innovation support programs to design? You know, how uh, do you really assess these specific problems that, that you want to address and then come up with targeted uh, programs to address them? But then also the program management level, how do you acquire funding? How do you get things started and get them producing some level of results, even in the face of the constraints? Um, management with a focus on results. So you know, emphasizing this, you know, the logic models, everything from the, the inputs right through to the, the long-term expected outcomes. Um, effective program design, that, but that, ex, that embraces experimentation, right? Because we are talking about innovation. So there isn't a, a standard off-the-shelf answer, yeah. you know, one find, even in the policy space, perhaps especially in the policy space. Um, but then related to that, building out structures for managing data and information. So you know, capturing reports on, on programs in, in progress, um, both qualitatively and, uh, and quantitatively, um, tabulating those things, visualizing, you know, ensuring that you have people who are trained in, in how to, to manipulate data in, in Excel, from in Python and R and so on. So ensure that you can visualize the results of what is taking place in progress at any given point in time, to be able to, to show and to tell the story. Because telling the story, even of a work in progress, is, is critical to, to both get that support and to maintain it. Um, taking a different view on failures, you know, and, and yeah, it, yeah we, we have, unfortunately, it's sort of historical and cultural views are, that, that look down on failures, but, you know, as anyone in the innovation space knows, failures are an essential part of a future success. So even analyzing the failures alongside the successes. Uh, and really just pushing for more collaboration, particularly amongst firms and between firms. So uh, at Compete, we, we ran a corporate venturing program that sought to uh, set up strategic partnership between corporations and, and startups, or in some cases, SMEs. Um, uh, there's another uh, program called Scale Up TNT that was you know, funded in a, in a pilot mode by Unitrust Corporation. And that focused on helping peer cohorts of, of SMEs to grow in terms of the sales and, and, and revenues and so on, and to demonstrate that growth quickly. So those are, uh, I would say, in terms of building capacity, but building capacity will, while doing, yeah? Because yep. the building capacity is required isn't something that you're gonna sit in a webinar, in a classroom, or even going off and, and study, and then come back and, all right, immediately apply. You need to apply it in practice and learn while doing. 
No, thank you. Yeah, I fully agree on that. So, I guess just looking at the time again, uh, we have time yes. for one more time for one more question from the audience. So I just want to probably the final question. Um, there's a question here about does industry need a stronger voice in some Caribbean countries? Are governments tuned into the needs of industry in the realm of innovation? Do you have any particular thoughts on that based on your experience? So to the first part of this industry need a stronger voice in some Caribbean countries, I would say yes, or perhaps using their voice um, uh, more strategically. Yeah. Uh, so what I mean by that, I mean, you, you often, and you hear through the media and so on, you, you hear when certain policy pronouncements are made and you can see the, you know, the fingerprints of industry on it. And they tend to deal with the sort of short-term concerns, you know, tax breaks and, and, and uh, uh, immediate financial concerns. Yeah. Which, I mean, obviously, as we were saying earlier, in the current context, they are understandable, but they're not enough. Yeah, so not just a stronger voice, but a voice that is more strategic towards not just what, it, what, what is required for, for my firm or what is required for you know, this small cluster of, of, of organ grouping of firms, but taking more of a cluster view, if you will, right? What, what are the, the major public investments? What are the things that we as private sector cannot do that the public sector can do that will allow this entire cluster, this entire industry uh, to be more competitive? Uh, and then the second part of the question I'm seeing here, are governments tune into the needs of industry in the realm of innovation? Um, I would say a lot of them say that they try to be. Some of them probably think that they are, um, but, but they're often not. And that is where, for example, the role of tech transfer offices plays yep. you know, is, is much more significant. So where governments don't directly run in, uh, universities, but they fund public universities. And where those universities and research centers have technology transfer offices. So they sit at the interface between research and between industry. It's not just, a, a, again, it's not one directional about, okay, researchers come up with this and we're gonna find a way to commercialize it. It is them going out and engaging with industry, getting on the shop floors, getting into yeah. what they're taking place, understanding in practice what they're faced with and then you know, prevent, providing them with solutions. And that is the way then that that information, again, going back to what I was saying about results and all of that and proper management of data, that information then can flow back up to governments and flow back up and, and influence policy. But right now, those links are, are not made in many cases. Yeah, no, and I think those points are vali uh, valid for many countries, not only Caribbean nations, I think even here in the UK, sometimes we observe that these things happen as well. So I think, yeah, def definitely something that is broader than just the Caribbean. Yeah. So I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, no, we, I'm, I'm afraid we cannot answer more questions. So firstly, I just want to, to really thank Kieran for, for your time today, for joining us today. It's been fantastic to, to share your experience here with us today. Uh, and to the audience and, and the people see watching this, we, we can just say that you can find more information about the different projects that we have talked about today on the Cambridge Industrial Innovation Policy community in our website. And or just feel free to contact us at any time. Also, Kieran, I'm happy. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're happy to, yeah. to be in touch with the people. I'm here on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just to say this webinar has been recorded, so it will be available in our website in the coming days for watching. And thank you everyone for joining. And if you're in the Caribbean, good morning, enjoy the rest of the day here in, in Europe, good afternoon. And thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, Kieran. Thank you, David, thank you team. Bye everyone. Cheers.